Welcome back, everybody, to session six. This session is on open source LLMs from Hugging Face and how to actually pull them in to your local development environment and build with them in a way that you can basically use any model that you want. You're not constrained to anybody's platform or anybody's API. This is going to be a quick intro, and we're going to get right into it. We've already talked about this in previous sessions, so it should be pretty straightforward. Our aim is very, very specific in this session. We simply want to understand how to set up Hugging Face open source models step by step. So we're going to see how to prepare these things to get them ready for prime time. Remember we talked in the earlier session that open source is slightly harder than the closed source GPT style, Anthropic, inflection. Anybody out there with a closed source model is going to be easier to pick up because you're just tapping an API. Here, open source requires a bit of setup. It requires you to load in the model, to load in the tokenizer, to configure the different quantization libraries, pull in accelerate from hugging face, pull in bits and bytes, Tim Detmer's bits and bytes, actually define a stopping criteria for verbose chat models. And of course, finally build the actual pipeline that will allow the model to effectively be used within the complex LM application you're building. So we're gonna jump right in and show you what this looks like in code for the Llama 2 7B chat model from New Research. Chris is gonna show us how to get this thing set up in case you want to use something similar in your application today. Chris, over to you, man. What's up? Okay, so we're going to use a portion of the other notebook that we saw. This is an alternate version that leverages open source tools. So I'm going to go ahead and share that with you guys now. Um, the idea is that we want to load our model, uh, but our model is very big. Uh, it's 7 billion parameters. Uh, which is too large to fit on a single consumer-grade GPU. Um, and so we need to use some kind of methods to reduce the amount of capacity it's going to take up on our uh, equipment. Now, there are many different ways that we can quantize. There are ways like GPTQ, which is a post-training method that lets us uh, essentially do a additional training step and that additional training step is going to be able to compute and reduce weights from our original size to a much smaller size. So generally, when we're talking about model weights, we need to understand what, what we mean, right? Now, each weight in a model or parameter is represented by a number, right? And that number is going to be uh, learned during training. And the number is going to be expressed in a uh, specific kind of data structure called a floating point number. And typically, at least in full precision, that's gonna be a 32-bit structure, right? So we talk about having 7 billion parameters, each of those parameters at 32 bits, you can begin to see just how much space these models can take up, right? Now, the way that information flows through our model, it is impacted by each of these weights, right? The weights are going to uh, make adjustments to the information that flows through our model. That's the whole point. That's the, the whole machine learning thing, right? We don't need, though, to store our models in full precision, so for 32-bit precision, unless it's strictly necessary. Now, what are some ways we could cut down? First of all, we could store our numbers in a smaller data type. So instead of a 32-bit precision number or FP32 full precision, we could instead use, say, 16-bit floating point numbers. Or we could use Google's format BrainFloat 16, which has 16 bits. Now, you might be asking yourself, well, what's the difference between FP32 or full precision versus a uh, brain float 16. There's a bunch of, uh, you know, technology that goes on behind the scenes here. But the idea is 
we're able to have similar ranges of numbers, but they are less precise. So you can imagine it, though this is a very simplified example, right? A full precision number would be able to represent the 0 0.01 through 0 0.1 range in a number. A floating point number would only be able to express that in terms of 0, 0 0.5, and 1, right? So instead of having the sliding scale from 0 0.01 all the way up to 1, we have less resolution in between each step. All this to say, those numbers are stored in a big data format, and we want to reduce it to a small data format. We don't want to, however, lose the ability of our model. So we have to be careful about which weights we change and how much we change them. And that's where methods like uh, GPTQ come in, which is a post training training phase that actually trains the new quantized weights. AWQ, activation aware weight quantization, which again is something that we do as a post processing step. What we're going to use instead is we're going to use a more um, out of the box solution where we're just going to actually quantize the weights straight away. We're not going to do a, a training phase. We're not going to care about the model. We're just going to quantize the weights and we're going to do, do it in such a way that we preserve as much information as possible. And in order to do that, we're going to leverage the bits and bytes library. So the bits and bytes library is going to let us take advantage of this bits and bytes config, which is going to let us use this load in four bit parameter. So instead of 32 bits or 16 bits, we're going to store our model in four bits, which is like much smaller, right? Uh, an incredible uh, space savings immediately just by loading this thing in four bit. We're going to use the NF4 uh, data type, which is uh, not literally theoretically maximal, but is empirically uh, uh, maximum. So it 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 reduces the information stored the least possible of all of the types of things that could do this, which is huge. And then uh, we're going to use this double quantization, uh, which means that we're going to, uh, qu whenever we quantize, because we're losing precision, we might actually need to uh, quantize a number differently than you would expect. So say our number was uh, near a certain range, say 127, right? Uh, instead of quantizing our number as 127, we might quantize it as two. And then our quantization content, our, our quantization constant might be 125, say for instance. It's a simp very simplified example. The idea is these quantization qu constants help us find the range and then our quantization uh, our, your quantized number is built from that information. In this case, we're going to also quantize the quantization constants uh, down to four bit. Everyone, everyone loves this uh, great meme. Uh, so interesting. So that means that this retraining quantization phase tries to adapt the weights with the reduced. Yes, that's correct, Ruben. Absolutely correct. So they're doing they're they're doing this uh, like AWQ and GBTQ use the training process to find the most optimal. Uh, quantized state for the weights. Uh, so they should reduce performance very little. And uh, they have another benefit, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. Uh, well, actually, we'll talk about right now, um, which is this idea that bits and bytes, whenever information passes through our network, because we've lost so much information going to 4-bit, we actually have to upcast our weights to uh, bfloat16 or another higher precision number. So while we do this by individual layer, so our cost or memory savings are still incredible, uh, it does require us to upcast a layer, do the computation, and then downcast the layer. And this adds inference latency, right? Every step we must do this. And while it has been optimized to work with most CUDA architecture, it is still going to be a bit slower. So the idea is we have to upcast the weights, compute, downcast the weights, and we rinse and repeat this process. Now, these other methods allow us to bypass some of that uh, uh, 
that specific inference latency requirements by optimally determining how to quantize their weights, how much to quantize them, and then uh, what, what they should be quantized to. So these other methods, while you can't really use them out of the box on some of these models because you'd have to have the actual hardware to quantize the model in the first place, right? They are going to be more efficient and have lower inference latency than a bits and bytes method. Um, that said, all of the popular models within about two days of their release are available on Hugging Face in all of the quantized formats. So you don't have to worry too much about that. So that's quantization and that's dope, right? We represent big number with small number and uh, we, we upcast it to a larger number during inference so that we don't lose precision. Uh, you know, that's, uh, that's great. Can we say this is like normalization standardization? We do a data processing. It, it kind of is. Yeah. Yeah. Man, Manny, I, I would say that's pretty close to, to what we're doing. We do care about the standard deviation. We do care about the mean. Uh, it, it is, it is the case that that's, uh, more true than not true. Uh, auto model for causal LM. This is how we use transformers to load models. Uh, we're going to take from pre-trained. You'll notice that we're passing in this new research, Llama 27B chat, uh, HF model ID, which is the new research version of Llama 27B. Uh, the reason we're using this is because uh, you do not require to sign up with Meta to use it. And so people who have not yet uh, signed the release for the Meta weights are still able to use this model. Then we're going to trust remote code because we have to. We're going to quantize our config. Uh, which is going to be what we just talked about. So it's going to load the model in a much smaller state than usual. And then we're going to map that automatically to all devices that we have. Uh, in this case, using a GPU environment, it's going to map it to our GPU. We're going to set our model into eval mode as we don't care to train it at this step. And so all we have to do is evaluate. So we set it to eval, just makes it run a little bit faster. You can see here, here is our model. And you can see that all of our weights, uh, with some exceptions, are in linear 4-bit. So you can see here that we have our uh, linear 4-bit Q-proj, K-proj, V-proj, our out projection, our rotary embeddings, no one cares. They're, they're not very big. Our embeddings, no one cares. They're not very big. And our, our RMS norms, or norm layers, you'll notice, specifically are not quantized. This is because our, our, uh, the normalization layers tend to close to zero values and low bit quantization is bad at representing uh, close to zero numbers. Uh, it's not, doesn't play nice in that range. And so we leave them in full precision where they take up an incredibly small amount of our models uh, weight space. So we don't care. And then finally our linear, which has to be in full precision. After that, we can load our tokenizer, which we can do much easier than our model. We just, uh, you know, load it from pre-trained and we pass in the model ID, done. Now, in order to generate things correctly or accurately, um, we, we cover some of those details, Ruben, yeah. Uh, not, not, not super, super in depth, but we do get into uh, a bit of how to implement it or how to, uh, how to make it happen in the code a little bit more specifically. Uh, for stop list, this is just saying when we want the model to stop doing generations. For stop tokens, we just want to put that stop list, but in token form. The idea is we want to encourage our model to stop generating after it meets this criteria. We're going to do the same thing with the stop tokens, but cast them to their appropriate torch tensors and shove them on the GPU. Just have to do that. Uh, torch requires everything to be on the same device. It is the best. Uh, for stop tokens, this is boilerplate. Uh, pick it up, use it. There you go. Next, we're going to use the Transformers pipeline to actually generate text. So now that you've loaded your model in 4-bit quantization, we need to actually do inference, and we use our Transformers pipeline object to do that. We pass in our quantized model. We pass in our tokenizer. We ask it to return the full text, which means it can return both the prompt and the generation. We ask it to do the text generation task. Makes sense, we're generating text. And then we stop the uh, model with our stopping criteria. 
set a low temperature. This is up to you. If you're doing like a very creative task, you can bump this up. If you're doing a very non-creative task, you can lower it to zero, uh, close to zero. Huggy Face Pipeline doesn't take zero. It has to be a non-zero positive float. Uh, and then how many tokens do you want to generate? And then a repetition penalty. Uh, these models will tend to want to repeat themselves and the rep repetition penalty uh, slaps it on the wrist when it starts to do that. Uh, if you want to dig into it, uh, community member one has a repo in which you can see how repetition penalty is actually implemented in Hugging Face. Uh, great resource if you haven't checked it out already. And with that, we can generate text. You know, what is the significance of a towel in Hitch Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? We print the result and we index it to the first generation with generated text. And we get, what is, you know, answer. And Douglas Adams, Hitchhiker, it's blah, 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 blah. The, the answer is there, basically. I mean, the idea is this is how we generate with our LLM. And that is, uh, that's how you do it. And that is a little bit about quantization. If you're using other quantization methods, uh, they all have different ways of playing with transformers. Almost all of them work out of the box. And if you pull the model from Hugging Face, the model card will have instructions on how to load the model and how to use it with popular frameworks. Yeah. There you go. All right. Good stuff, man. So in case you didn't catch that, that was a lot. We got a brief little recap here for you on the key points of what's going on. We take big models, but they're too big. We want to make them smaller. Now, at the same time, we want to make them bigger, right? If you saw Andre's talk, they're just going to get bigger and bigger. What's the point? The point is making them smaller and smaller is going to be more and more important all the time. The more parameters, the more compute, the less efficient, and the more parameters, the more weights means the more bits. And when we're dealing with full precision, 32 bits, we want to see if we can actually make that a little bit less intense all the time. Models like 01.ai's Yi that we did an event on recently are constantly, as Chris mentioned, releasing the quantized version of their models. And this quantization is simply taking big, making small, moving from something like 32-bit down to something like 4-bit. And then we're doing this upcasting during inference. Tim Detmers is a guy you should probably know about, follow. He's been doing his PhD on like quantization stuff forever. and. Uh, he was responsible, among uh, others, I imagine his advisor included, for the low-rank adaptation of large language models, the LoRa configuration that has made it into basically everything now, as well as QLoRa and the Bits and Bytes library. So a lot of stuff to check out on this front of making big models smaller. A lot to be discussed here, but for today, we're just trying to get you guys set up to pull stuff down from Hugging Face, which is great, and make big models smaller, make chat models less verbose, build a quick pipeline, perform inference, and keep on building. Next session, we'll be back to talk about evaluation of RAG with RAG assessment or RAGUS.